welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. We just came over from the Two Witnesses Live uh, broadcast, which we do every Monday, generally every Monday uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I as promised, I said I was going to come over here and and go into greater detail for the true the uh, True Word Faith for Life um, group. I thank you. I appreciate you more than you'll know. So let's get right into it. He said, she said, women pastors. Oof, oof. Boy, we have stepped in it today, right? Because how did this happen? How did I come to do this? Well, I had a message that I, I preached a long time ago. I preached this also to prospective seminarians. I preached it to just regular folks. Hello, by the way. Um, I am so thankful that you all have joined me. And some of you are doubleheader. Hello, Heather. Hello, man. Tinfoil Hatter. Appreciate you joining. It's uh, And one of you, you know, is a doubleheader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Hey, Leilani, you too. Thank you for joining. It's just wonderful. I um, I really appreciate it. And so all that said to say this, I may have to look at my phone periodically because we have an issue with with someone that's uh, really kind of a critical thing. And I want to make sure I, I'm paying attention to it because there may be emergencies. Uh, so how this came about, it, you know, I, I've, I've preached this sermon and I've taught this class uh, obviously, in greater detail than I'm going to deliver today, the class would be in greater greater detail, um, because it's a it's a needed thing. It's a thing that comes up a lot to me. Um, it is not uh, turn up the volume. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see here. I can go a little bit louder, a little bit louder. How about that? Let me know if that's okay. I appreciate you letting me know. Y'all are my sound techs. Uh, make sure your volume is turned up because because I'm I'm in the I'm almost in the red right now. It's it's uh it's not liking me. It's going, oh Dr. Sean, we don't like oh yeah, we're in the yellow. Okay, let's let's go with that. That's a, we're really, really kind of pushing it at this point. But you let me know if uh no, I can let me change this to one other thing. Okay, how about how about that? Okay, is it okay? A little bit better. Something something weirds going on. Anybody else experiencing that in chat? I would love to know. Um, we would like to try to isolate it to see if it's a um, on Leilani's end or if it, is anybody else experiencing not being able to hear. That being said, until I get that feedback in chat, um, I'll I'll go on. So, a dear friend of mine who is involved, we became friends through the Honor of the Warriors Foundation, which is a, an amazing foundation that um, I, I credit with getting me up off the couch and, and helping me uh, to still be alive today. And uh, a little bit low. Okay, so I don't want that. So let me, here you go. Let me do this. Boom, 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 boom. And then let me do this. Let me put it up a little bit more. Um, let me know if that's good, because now we, we are solidly in the red for some reason. And uh, okay, there we go. Um, hopefully that's good. Oh, I can go one more. Okay, there we go. So he and I, this this great organization that we we uh, we really, uh, you know, honor the Warriors Foundation, founded by Jerry and Jane. Um, more unbelievable people. It, it got me up off the couch. I was just waiting to die. And it's this recumbent trikes. They use rec adaptive recumbent trikes to help people, um, really help people, disabled veterans specifically, uh, help us to get moving, um, get around other veterans, and understand that we're not alone. You know, you, you're a disabled veteran, you know, sometimes... You're, you're by yourself. Anyway, so I met this dear friend, Dennis, through this organization. I'm glad I did. I've met so many wonderful, amazing people. Uh, I absolutely love Jerry and Jane and, and so many others who are affiliated with the Honor of the Warriors Foundation. They're doing amazing work on a shoestring. So if you have extra money laying around, they, they wouldn't be a bad um, idea to give to. They, they, are, they are worthy and they're careful with every penny. Let me also say at the outset, because I forgot to say this last one, those of you who subscribe to podcasts, uh, I think I put it in the description 
uh, of the page, the True Word Faith for Life page. I think I did. I'm not 100% sure. So I don't know if it's there or not, but the link to the RSS feed, which is this thing. And so I have a podcast because I have a face for radio. I also now thank you to Christy of the Top Soul Insider a podcast, an amazing, amazing interviewer, an amazing podcast. She does an amazing job. Well, she has helped me immensely. And and so uh, I have this podcast and it takes me a little while once we're finished here to isolate the audio and to send it through. But, you know, that's what I do. And, and as I learn to do it, it'll be better. Hey, welcome back, Dr. Klaus. I just did my uh, German accent. Um Thinking of you, brother. And so in this case, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of these things that my buddy was in church and they were ordaining a, a female and a female minister. And, you know, he was like, oh, what do I do? You know, how do I, how do I refute this? And, and how do I argue this? And my approach is, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an argument. It can be you may disagree, but you have to isolate. Well, why do I disagree? Do I disagree because, you know, this is how I've been taught. This is what I've been taught. And, um, you know, I'm comfortable with this. I feel good. I feel good about this, this um, doctrine, if you will, or this belief. So the scriptural support for denying women the office of ordained pastor is primarily based on specific passages. Um, let me go ahead and turn... Boom, boom. Okay, good, good, good. So we don't want the phone ringing unless there's an emergency. Um, so anyway, the, the, the scriptural support for denying women the office of ordained pastor is primarily based on specific passages from the New Testament. Now, let me, let me first address that and say um, there's something that I always caution against, and that's called proof texting. That's, that's finding verses that kind of say what you believe and you that you want to say or you want to believe confirmation bias you use those to confirm what it is you 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 believe and maybe that's in an argument with another person or maybe there's some sort of dispute and you want to you want to argue your case and so i'm i'm very very careful in that to say okay well it doesn't nearly have to be an argument it can be um it can, it can be something different than an argument. It doesn't have to be an argument. And I firmly believe that. So uh, also, let me say, I rarely use the New International Version or NIV. From here on out, I'll say NIV, but that stands for the New International Version. I don't use that a whole lot um, of the many Bibles that I have. I have several NIVs. NIV Bible was one of the first where I was really, really digging into the Word and uh, my faith was growing. So it has a place. It's just not one I use. I don't use it at all for any scholarly work, any academic work, um, any, you know, very little for research. And for that reason, there's another translation I don't use very often either. Um, but we won't start that fight today. Anyway, um, so, but in this rare case, uh, though I rarely use the NIV, in this case, I'm using the NIV translation because this is one of the most common. It's, it's the most consistent across the board. It's not, oh, we're, we're against it. Oh, we're for it. Oh, we're, you know, it's, it doesn't, it, in that particular case, you know, it's representing a viewpoint, um, a, tra a translation philosophy or ideology that is, you know, kind of even across the board. Um, whenever citing the original languages, by the way, uh, the support for women speakers, teachers, and ministers is much stronger um, as the custom among the followers of the way concerning Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek translation. So as their customs and culture, they were far more likely to support in select cases, women preaching and teaching. So like the complete Jewish Bible and, and other translations that I have, they, they typically are going to be more supportive toward that, as is shock to people is the, the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek tradition and the tradition and cultures and context of the people. I'm going to discuss that more. And so let's get started. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14. Again, these are all from the NIV. I want to be consistent and fair. And um, I wanted you know, to have a kind of an even 
uh, view across the board. So, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, for Adam was formed first, and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now you hear that, and you think, see, that's why women aren't permitted to preach. Well, okay, podcast over. It's over, we're done, we're finished. See, that was quick. That's the shortest sermon Dr. Sean has ever preached. Well, slow down, slam dancer. We got more to go. So let's look at the true context in detail. So to understand the cultural and customs context of 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, it's essential to discern the historical and the social circumstances of the early Christian communities, particularly in Ephesus, where Timothy was stationed. Now, 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14 again, for consistency, NIV. And I may interrupt myself, that's just how I am. I am rude that way. Let me make sure this is all okay. Uh, okay, boom, boom, boom. So, uh, my dear brother, who is going to be a guest on here, he and his wife, Myra, who I've known, phew, gosh, most of my life, the home folk from back home, I'm going to have them on the show. You talk about Hebrew knowledge and kind of approaching things differently as a matter of being a follower of the way, there you're going to be fascinated by that. Anyway, uh, so here we go. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Well, I guess he told you. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Okay, that's the creation order. We'll discuss this in a second. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner, except for Adam was right there, did nothing to stop her, and then he blamed her. This woman you gave me. This is failed leadership. This is the first case of failed leadership in mankind. This is an indication that Adam was a poor leader and he couldn't be trusted to protect Eve from Satan. Why? Because he was there and he didn't protect Eve from Satan because he couldn't. No, he just didn't. Historical and cultural background. Okay, let's give you some of this. This is, this is going to be fun. So little things don't mean a lot. Little things mean... Everything. Ephesus and the Artemis cult. Oh, he said cult. Good lands. We hate that. Cult. Yeah, there was cults. There was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. It was all, all around. Um, it was, uh, oh man, I got to tell you. I got to tell you. Stuff was crazy. It was crazy. The Artemis cult, Ephesus. Ephesus was the significant center for the worship of Artemis. This was a goddess whose temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, right? So there is a world outside of what's happening in the Bible. There's world going on. There's life going on. There's history going on. There's all kinds of other stuff, all kinds of other cultures, all kinds of other beliefs going on. And remember, this is, this is, this is a new thing. Uh, monotheism, faith in one God, the one true God. That's a new thing because this is, um, you know, not for nothing. Life was different. Life was different. Life was crazy. Things were nuts. Things were, wow, things were really, really nuts. So this was going on. So the cult of Artemis. So one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, that's pretty cool right? That'd be something cool to see. Not get involved in, not buy the book, not buy the, you know, not, not do the little secret handshake or whatever it is you got to do. Uh, but the cult of Artemis included many female priestesses, right? So this, this, this cult, the cult of Artemis, emphasized female dominance in religious practices. So the, pre, the, the prominence of this cult likely influenced local customs. Why? Because big things influence littler things. So this potentially led to conflicts or misunderstandings within the nascent Christian community, the new, the baby Christian community regarding gender roles. It, it, obviously, that things have an effect. So the role of women in Greco-Roman society. In general, Greco-Roman society, women were often expected to remain in domestic roles, right? Stay at home, stay in the kitchen, bake cakes, um, cupcakes, brownies, burn the edges a little bit. 
Just saying, putting that out there. Just some, just general advice. They were expected to be in these domestic roles, and they they weren't typically involved in public teaching or leadership. That just wasn't the culture. However, exceptions did exist in this, especially in religious contexts where women could hold significant roles, such as in the Artemis cult. Right? This is this is a new crazy thing. This whole followers of the way, not follower of a bunch of ways, but followers of the way. So what do you have here? You have a conflict. You have there's there's the um, the a collision. Right? I used to do a radio show called God in Country: The Collision of Faith and Politics. There is by nature a collision. Right? So Jewish traditions. Let's talk about what was going on within the Jewish community. Early Christian teachings, they were heavily influenced by Jewish traditions. Why? Why would they not be? Right? This is where it's all happening. And they all have their individual things that they do. Right? These are things that they do. This is their culture. This is their way. This is this, these are the things that are driving culture. And so the Jewish culture obviously would be influenced by Jewish traditions. And, and, you know, and not for nothing, synagogue worship and teaching, they were male-dominated, right? Women weren't permitted to read the Torah publicly. Many of them couldn't read at all, so they weren't permitted. And that's not to say that women weren't the only ones that couldn't read. Literacy was a very small percentage. Um, illiteracy really was a big thing. Women mostly, because women weren't permitted to read Torah publicly or teach in synagogues. So that was a big deal. Torah reading and synagogue life, that was huge. That was the center of your community if you were a Jew. So this background would have influenced Paul or Shaul, uh, in, and, and that's, that's his real name. Paul, we came up with that. We made that up. And other early Christian leaders in structuring church order, right? You got to have an order. We got to have an order here because the church is so new. Followers of the way, they're doing their thing. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know if it's okay, but wowza, we got to come up with some order. We got to come up with some rules. We got to come up with some doctrine. We got to come up with an orthopraxis. How do we do what we do? Now, why was this said? Why was this said? Why did he say that whole big thing? Well, order and worship and teaching. Paul's instructions, they, they aim to maintain order and propriety in worship and teaching within the church, given the disruptive potential of different cultural expectations. Right? These instructions sought to unify the community under a consistent practice, right? You're unified when you all do a consistent practice. That's so utterly critical. Y'all are so kind in chat, by the way. That's super sweet. I'm just a beggar who found bread, the bread of life, and just trying to tell other beggars where I found it. So correcting false teachings. Obviously, in any situation, you're going to have false teachings. By the way, hello to the Facebook community, the X community, and, um, and the YouTube community, and those of you who will be listening on podcast later when we convert this to an audio-only podcast. Follow me, the True Word Faith for Life um, podcast wherever you do podcast. Anyway, correct false teachings. I have to thank Christy of the Topsail Insider because if if it weren't for her, I could not get on that. I couldn't do all of it. I'm on this thing called Buzzsprout. If you go to buzzsprout.com, you search me, boom, there you'll find it. You can subscribe to my feed. It's free. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Just like this. I would love if you if you haven't clicked on subscribe for whatever reason, haven't clicked on subscribe or or like and share and all that, click on the little bell on this channel. Please do that. Please do that. It's it's more important than you can ever understand. Anyway, correcting false teachings. There is evidence that false teachings were spreading in Ephesus, partly propagated by certain women. Right, they were behind a lot of this. Speaking of women, um, I have a dear friend. Uh, you notice I'm wearing Sea Hag Marina, Steenhatchee, Florida. Um, you know, pray for them. They are absolutely facing a massive, massive challenge right now with this storm. They don't need another storm. They don't need to be flooded out. They don't need to have to replace everything they just replaced. Um, you know, and this storm is really pounding. And I just pray that that when the king tide comes, that you know that they'll be okay. So we're going to pray for them at the end. 
Um, but if you would add them to your prayer list, if you have a, a prayer list, add them to it because they need it. And the people of Florida in general, it's a tough time. Very low lying area. You say, well, why are those people? You know, it's a low lying area. So obviously when the water rises, it's going to, it's going to drench a lot of houses and a lot of businesses and they've, they're economically really challenged. So Paul's directive could have been a response to specific specific instances of false doctrine being taught, aiming to prevent the spread of erroneous teachings, right? When there's false teaching or erroneous teaching, you got to deal with it right away. And there was some crazy stuff going on in Ephesus. And, and some of that was propagated by certain women. So Paul said, hey, I got to step in. I got, I, got to, I got to correct some things. So cultural sensitivity and witness, right? The early church was they were keenly aware of their public witness. Why? Because they were new, because they were fresh, because they were raw, because they're trying to influence others who have radically different beliefs. And maybe this was family members. Maybe this were people in their community. Maybe people they were doing business with, whatever the case may be, but they're trying to influence these people to come to faith as a follower of the way. And sometimes they are, they are, Jews, traditional Jews. Now, remember, when Jews came to be followers of the way, they didn't cease to be Jews. They were still Jews, but they were Messianic Jews, right? Um, uh, Dr. David Friedman, my dear friend and famous author, best-selling author many, many times over. Um, he has the number one health and wellness radio show in the United States. He has an amazing alternative care practice. He is, he is one of the top. Well, he's a Messianic Jew. He's a Messianic Jew. I am friends with many Messianic Jews. I've spoken at many Messianic uh, uh, synagogues and and um, and uh, you know temples and and they're wonderful. They're they've been so welcoming and so wonderful. By the way, pray for Israel. Pray for them. They are they are really facing it, and they're fighting it largely alone. And um, you know because of politics, because of crazy people. Um, you know there's. Anyway, if it was us that was being attacked the way that they are, we would do whatever was necessary to stop it and to put an end to it finally and completely. So anyway, not for nothing. So the early church, they, they were aware of its public witness. They were aware of its rep, right? Its reputation. And they didn't want to have a bad reputation. That was important to them. That, that should be how we are. We should think about that. We should consider those things. Hey, how does this look? Because, you know, Yeshua told his disciples, they shall know me by how you love one another. In actual translation in the Hebrew and Aramaic, if you express that, it means they're only going to see me when they see you loving one another, right? And so this is our witnesses. So these practices, they, they sharply contrasted with the societal norms that could create obstacles to the gospel message. True story. I mean, that's reality, right? That's the mechanics of living in life. So by adhering to more traditional roles, the church aimed to avoid unnecessary offense to potential converts. We should all think about that, right? We should all consider those things. So how about the broader theological context? Um, you know, Paul said some things, and I don't necessarily agree with everything, and sometimes I have to really, really pray and consider how he does things, because sometimes he, he's contradictory. There's a reason he's contradictory, and there's a reason in a context to, to why he's saying something different. Remember, his life is vastly different. He was killing Christians or followers of the way, and he was he was he terribly opposed followers of Yeshua, and yet now look, wrote most of the New Testament. Paul, Saint Paul, amazing, absolutely amazing. So I love the guy, but he justifies his instructions by referencing the creation order. That's what we call that. Adam was first, and then Eve, right? So the creation order. So, and then he cites the fall. How did they fall? Well, uh, well, you know, Eve sinned. And he points to theological reasoning that transcends the immediate cultural context. Now, let me say, let me repeat again, Adam was there, lest you be deceived. Eve was not there hearing from the serpent alone. She wasn't alone. No, she was, sorry, I got to change the way my spine is sitting. Uh, I apologize. Every now and then it just gets to be 
pain. I can manage you mostly, but woof, sometimes, wowza. Anyway, you know, you see stars and I'm talking to you and I'm seeing stars of pain. It's crazy. Anyway, so, so remember, you know, Adam is there and he didn't do anything. As I said, you know, he's a terrible leader. He didn't do anything. Not because he couldn't. It's because he didn't. He just didn't. He was a wuss. Somebody asked me in the last broadcast, well, why did Adam do that? Because he was a wuss. And he, and he learned, you know, and we all learned, we've all experienced. It wasn't just Eve's sin. It was our sin. It wasn't just Eve's deception. It was our deception. It was Adam's deception. We are all caught up in that. And so anyway, so temporary measures. So some scholars argue that Paul's instructions were intended as a temporary measure. Right? These are temporary measures because he's addressing specific issues in Ephesus rather than universal timeless commands, right? This is he's talking. Remember when I talk about in my book, a coming book, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Klaus uh, is helping me get my book published. And, um, and in that book, I talk about the audience. Who's the audience? We must know who the audience is. We must know what's going on in that community. What is bringing about this communication? What is driving this conversation? What's driving this command? Well, we got to know those things. And so in my book, um, which is going to be available to you, I mean, I don't know how long it takes, but the fact of the matter of it is it will be broadly available and I'm excited about it. So, and, and many thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Klaus, because man, awesome, awesome with all he's facing. We need to pray for him every day. Um, so, so, the, you know, let's, let's focus in, let's, let's identify that this is, this is, he's, He's giving these measures, addressing something specific in Ephesus. He's not giving a broad command to the whole world forever. No, it's Ephesus. He's dealing with Ephesus. He's directed to them these comments. Anyway, equality in Christ. Look, it's essential to balance these instructions with other Pauline writings, right? That's what we call the writings of Paul, Pauline writings. They emphasize the equality of all believers. Galatians 3.28, great example. The tension between these perspectives has been the subject of much debate, much theological debate. And a lot of people say, well, you know, that's why I don't believe the Bible, because, you know, there's contradiction. Well, slow down, slam dancer. Slow down, slam dancer. You know, study a little bit hard, a little bit deeper. So what's the conclusion on this passage's meanings? So Paul's instructions in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, were influenced by the cultural, religious, and social dynamics of Ephesus. He was aiming to maintain order. He was aiming to counteract false teachings and present a consistent Christian witness. That's, that's what was important. That's what's driving this discussion. So understanding these specific historical contexts, it helps to interpret these verses within the broader narrative of Scripture, right? And the early church's mission. It's different for them. They were at the beginning. This is the new thing. This is the very, very new thing. It's so at the beginning. So, so we have to remember, right? We have to remember. We have to remember, must, must, must remember the context of the time. We must remember that. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. Women should remain silent in the churches, they are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, for the law says, as the law says, well, he's taken some liberties here. The law, well, it's, it's, it was given as an instruction, not as a law, capital L of God, that women can't speak in the church. So that that's when we interpret that as the law, you know, when we say as the law says, we have to remember that's small L, not capital L. Uh, so how about 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7? That should be fun. This passage outlines the qualifications for pastors, for overseers, which is pastors and elders, right? Overseers is the name they use. And it uses male pronouns, as the Bible does. It implies uh, a, a male office holder. So here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. And that's true. It is. It's a hard job. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, right? The, you know, uh, 
polygamy or plural marriage was a thing. You know, it's never scripturally, it's, it was never um, stopped. I don't advocate it, but I'm just saying it was never stopped. People say, well, you know, you know, these terrible people that have that. Well, it was never stopped. Scripturally, it was never stopped. You say, well, you should be the husband of one wife. Well, go look at my teaching on the True Word Faith for Life channel, and you will see um, that that doesn't mean what you think it means. Anyway, faithful to his wife. That's important. Temperate. Can't have a bad temper. He's got to be self-controlled. He's got to be above reproach. He's got a good, uh, good reputation. He's got to be respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Look, he can't be a putz who can't teach because an overseer needs to be able to teach. Not given to drunkenness. Hey, drunkenness was a big deal then. He can't be a drunk. can't be running around getting drunk. He can't be violent. He's got to be gentle because he's got to deal with people. Not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He can't be, can't be a greedy dude. He might be handling money. He might be handling a tithe. He might be uh, from other people. He can't be a lover of money. He can't be greedy. He can't always be picking fights. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. Well, that's reasonable. How can he, how can he give advice? How can he give advice on what other people do if, he's, if everything in his life is chaos? Right? It's very important. Man, you know what? Mad tinfoil hatter, you are right. Caring about your reputation went out the window in the hippie years. Boy, that is true. And, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Amen. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Great question. He must not be a recent convert. But he can't be a baby in the faith because he doesn't know much. Or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgments as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, obviously, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. How about Titus 1, 5 through 9? This passage also outlines qualifications for elders. Again, using male pronouns because that's what they did. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. Why? Because this structure is new. This structure is a, is a different thing. This church thing, this followers of the way thing, this is different. This is totally and radically different. This is not how it was. They had a structure for traditional temple worship and, and synagogue worship. And, you know, this, that all drove the community. That was the center of community. So they had that, but for the followers of the way, they didn't have that. So they're creating elders and creating all these different roles because they had to share the responsibilities and the tasks at hand. So el appointing elders, back to the verse, elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So remember, you know, growing up, I remember... Uh, if a pastor came to candidate to be a pastor for a church, he was a prospective a pastor of a church, he would come and preach and, you know, usually be a weekend thing. And he'd preach a few sermons and he would meet with the deacons and meet with different families. Hey, this is, this is all great. But if during the conversation they found one of his children, let's say he had three children and, and one of the three wasn't a believer, well, he couldn't be picked because they would take this um, a little bit out of context and go, well, if one of your children is not a believer, you know, well, so let's say one of your children does something, uh, maybe they are a believer, but you know, they get pregnant or maybe you are a believer and they, and they, uh, they get, they get caught drunk, you know, they, they take the family car and they're drinking underage and they run into a tree and now they're in trouble or wh whatever the case may be. First of all, those, those are forgivable things. And we, should, we shouldn't ever be unkind to anybody in that situation. We should love them, both, both the person. We don't love the sin, we love them. I'm, I'm so imperfect. I'm so wildly imperfect. I can't throw stones because, quite frankly, I am a glass house. But I like to teach and I like to share where I found the bread. And the fact of the matter of it is, this verse has some value to it in the fact that not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Listen, folks, if you're a good teacher, you're going to be a good teacher in your home. Right? I remember when my, when my dear friend, when this happened in her life, I remember uh, her dad, who was the pastor. 
he was going to step down. He, he tendered his reg. We, we didn't accept it, by the way. We said, no. No, we're going to love you all through this. We're not, we're not, you know, hey, mistakes happen. We're going to love you through it. And that was the right thing to do. And they're amazing people. They're all amazing people. One of them's one of my very best friends. So, but you can't be open to the charge of wild and disobedient. That was, that was the consideration. They were wild back then. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Man, these passages. Ooh, we could just stop here, right? Right, why, why go on? We just stop here. These passages are often interpreted by those who confirmation, their, their confirmation bias opposes the ordination of women. So maybe that's what they believe. So they read these verses and they go, oh, that's it. See, argument over. Well, it doesn't have to be an argument in the first place. It can be a discussion. We should be able to have this discussion and still be friends. We should still be in the kingdom. Circular firing, firing squads are stupid. Churches and conservatives do it all the time. That's it. I'm out. Take my toys. I'm forming the Seventh Baptist Church, right? Because the First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, Third, they were all formed because somebody got mad and stormed out. And maybe sometimes when, when there's heresy or or blasphemy or whatever the case may be, sometimes you do have to you do have to leave. You say, hey man, I can't I can't get with that. You have to decide that. Doesn't mean you throw a grenade in the church as you're leaving. Doesn't mean you can't be friends with people, although many times relationships, even family relationships, are ended over such things. And it's just silly. So if your confirmation bias opposes the ordination of women, you could see these verses as an indication that the roles of teaching and exercising authority within the church are reserved for men. Oh, I understand completely. However, it's worth noting that these scriptures' interpretations and applications vary widely among different denominations and theological perspectives. Look, folks, that's reality. That is reality. Some Christian groups interpret these passages within their historical and cultural context, and they support the ordination of women based on other scriptural principles of equality and the examples of women leaders in the Bible. And look, when I cite these, by no means is this an exhaustive list. Remember, most people, even many mature Christians, they don't know the cultural and linguistic context of the people, time, and place. They most often do not know, they're not familiar with Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. They don't, they don't know cultural context. And look, cultural context or lack thereof leads to biases. And therefore, they most often miss the point of truth. So what happens is traditional modern-day teaching from teachers and pastors who are only repeating what they were taught by teachers or preachers who also didn't have the requisite knowledge to teach about such things. And with that misguided teaching comes that lack of original languages and cultural context, creating a confirmation bias. Look, I often say, let not your preference be your theology. Man, you want, to, you want to write that down. Let not your preference be your theology. We talk a lot about, well, I don't like that modern worship music with the guitars and the drums. I don't like it. Should be a piano. That's it. Well, that's preference speaking. Well, that music is ungodly. Now, sometimes some modern worship music, worship music is ungodly. It's, it's not based on scripture and it just goes on and on and on, vain repetitions and all these things. But sometimes it's the most worshipful thing I ever heard. Now, I love hymns, but I also love worship music. If it's the right kind, there's hymns that aren't scriptural. They're not theologically accurate. So thus the saying, let not your preference be your theology. Don't make into theology what is actually your preference. Many only want to learn and know what confirms what they already are inclined to prefer, what they're already inclined to believe. Therefore, confirmation bias, it's a dangerous thing. It spoils the opportunity for truth. Really, that's what we want. Look, I, I have learned things 
Um, I talked about on the Two Witnesses Live, and I talk about it here, and I talk about it often, the impact of Dr. Moen, Dr. Arthur uh, J. Moen, in my life. Right, his teaching when I was in divinity school and somebody, it, it was it was different. It was so different. It was radically different. And 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 at first I I didn't want to even be associated. With it. And 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 then guess what happened? I I came under conviction. I said, well, wait a second. You know, listen, I'm supposed to be higher learning. You know, this is I'm I'm supposed to dig down deep. I'm supposed to get in deep with this. So let me listen and then let me make a decision. And it turns out, you know, he didn't convince me. He showed me. And I learned, and I had to repent of that. And I learned if I'm going to really learn something, I have to, I have to have a little bit of more of an open mind and listen, listen. Don't don't stop a person when they're telling you something. When they get to the point you don't like what they're saying, you don't stop them there because you may understand what they're saying if you listen a little bit more. Now, so most people though. If we're being honest, you know, I'm being honest here, I'm in this group. This is me too, right? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm inclined to believe a certain way based on cultural context, based on how I grew up, based on what I was taught when I was young, I'm inclined to believe a certain way. Hey, I, my bias, my confirmation bias, I only believe what proves or, or pushes forward that thing I believe, confirming my bias. And when I do that, I spoil any opportunity for truth. So we have to ask ourselves, what and who is driving my belief? That's a good question to ask ourselves. What and who is driving our belief? So now we're at the point where, okay, is there any scriptural, scriptural, scriptural support for ordaining women pastors? Is there any? Yes. There is substantial scriptural support for ordaining women pastors. Several passages in the New Testament highlight women's roles and contributions to ministry. Not little contributions, but big contributions. So here are some vital verses. That, again, not an exhaustive list, just some. Cited to support the ordination of women. And again, for consistency, I use the NIV, though that is not a translation I typically use. The complete Jewish Bible and other more accurate translations tend to land on this side. So that's why I didn't want to use those translations, because I felt the NIV in this case was more kind of down the middle. Um, and, and, and so you can make a decision from that. But if you read those translations, the complete Jewish Bible, true, true life, you know, whatever, any of the others, you're going you're gonna to see... They tend to land more on um, endorsing uh, women in certain leadership roles in their translation. So, Galatians 3.28. I better hurry because we're already at 42 minutes, 39 seconds. Good lands. Hang on, folks. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse is often interpreted to mean that in Christ, right? That's what we say when we are believers. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we are united. That's how we are bound together. You say, stop. I don't like that. I don't like it. Well, you don't have to like it, but this is what unites us. You may disagree with people, but this is what the scripture says. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Good lands, we need to get along. This verse is often interpreted to mean that in Christ, in Christ, in that faith, that joint faith, that thing that links us together, the community, traditional social distinctions, including gender, are transcended. Well, let's not stop there. Acts 2, 17 and 18. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. This passage indicates that both men and women will receive the Holy Spirit and prophecy equally. And this implies an active role in ministry. But don't stop there. We have more. Free of charge and no cost or obligation to you. Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend to you. Oh, I love this. I commend to you. In other words, Tom, you protect this person. You, you surround this person. You, you encourage this person. You 
you protect literally and figuratively. I commend to you our sister, Phoebe. Mm, are you ready for this next thing after the comma? A deacon of the church in Concre. She's a deacon in this church. I ask you to receive her in the Lord, the thing that unites us, folks. That's the thing that's supposed to unite us. We're not supposed to have all these stupid arguments that separate us. We're supposed to be united. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people. How, how will they know, they being the unsaved, they being the people that have not come to faith and are not followers of the way in our, in our current world and in that world then, how will they know lest we love one another, lest we protect and care for one another? worthy of his people, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, wait for it, including me. Phoebe's referred to as a deacon. She's referred to as a deacon in the church, suggesting she held a recognized position of leadership. Well, let's not stop there, just for fun, because it's free if charge and no cost or obligation you i move on greek uh, i'm sorry greet adronicus and junia my fellow jews now look they were in prison with him they're tight when you're in prison you're in that situation you're, you're tight with some folks right you you form some bonds and so they were there with him they suffered with him my fellow jews who have been in prison with me they are outstanding among the apostles Oh, slow down, slam dancer. You mean they, they being both of them, Andronicus and Junia, were both apostles? They are both apostles, and they were outstanding? And they were in Christ. In other words, they came to faith. They came to be followers of Yeshua before I was. Junia is mentioned as being an outstanding, being outstanding among the apostles. Some, including me, as a theologian, I interpret that as recognizing her as a female apostle. Now, let's not stop there just because we're on our wall. Philippians 4, 2, and 3. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers who names, whose names are in the book of life. Folks, Euadia and Synthike, they're described as co-workers in the gospel. This indicates their active involvement in ministry. Let's not stop there. Just for fun, we're on a lean. 1 Corinthians 11, 5. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. What's the worst possible thing a woman could have had in this culture, especially a Jew, to have her head uncovered and her head shaved? That's why the Nazis shaved the women's head. It wasn't just because of the lice, to prevent the lice. It was to embarrass and to shame them. That's why they had them parade naked in front of them. That's why all of these things were done, to shame them, because they knew that in their Jewish or Hebrew culture, that was the worst thing you could do to them. So we bring up the discussion, right? A lot of people will go directly to, oh, you know, women should have their head covered, right? Because she dishonors her own head, right? She's dishonoring her own head by having her head uncovered. So you see women in some traditions will wear, and, and, and this is a pejorative, a doily uh, on their head, a little thing on their head. A lot of times it's lace. They're usually very pretty. Sometimes they're, they're handmade. Many times they're handmade. Uh, many different women in different traditions, Mennonite tradition, they cover their head with a certain type of bonnet. In many different traditions, the Amish and otherwise, there's, there's many traditions that do this. Many Pentecostal traditions, they still do this, right? So, so that's a thing, and you've got to make a decision whether you're going to cover your head. I had to make a decision. There's, there's an argument to be made, a scriptural argument to be made, that I should cover my head with either, either kiput or yarmulke, right? That, that even though I'm not Jewish, the purpose of that isn't specifically and only a Jewish thing. There's a purpose and a reason for it. I'm not going to get into that here because good lands, we don't have time. We're 49 minutes, 28 seconds. You guys have lunch to eat, and so do I. 
But every woman who prays or prophesies, what? She prays or prophesies? Prophesies? This passage acknowledges that women were praying and prophesying in the early church. These are activities associated with ministry roles. Well, let's not stop there just for fun. We're, we've gone over the... You don't want to, if you've ever been on a roller coaster... And then all of a sudden you get right about the top. And you're like, oh man, we all like Donkey Kong. I'm in for it. Here we go. We're right there. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos. This is Acts 18, 24 and 26. 20 through 24 through 26. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Yeshua accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home, and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Oh, man. Oh, hold on a second. Let's go back. Let's rewind. So, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a name of, and, and so he's come to Ephesus, and he's a learned man. He's got thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He knows a lot of stuff. He's been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor. He taught about Yeshua accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. In other words, he only knew to talk about the baptism of John, and not all of us dying to our sin and being raised up in a newness of life. He didn't teach about that. He didn't know. So he had to be corrected, gently and lovingly. So when Priscilla and Aquila heard them, they knew there was something that needed to be done. So they lovingly brought him into their home, and they kindly explained to him the way of God more accurately. Well, Priscilla and her husband Aquila, they're involved in teaching Apollos. That is a big deal. That's a role that suggests a level of authority and knowledge. Look, Proponents of women's ordination often interpret these passages to show that women played significant and sometimes leadership roles in the early church because they did. That's inarguable. We can, we can argue about some things. We can argue all kinds of things, but we cannot argue that these things happen. So they argue that these examples, along with broader biblical principles of spiritual equality. We don't like to hear that word. We think, well, you're going woke. We're going woke. No, we're not. This is not, this doesn't have anything to do with woke. This is so not woke. There is absolutely biblical principles of spiritual equality. I do a sermon that Jesus loved women when others didn't, right? He, he, he loved and incorporated women very much in his ministry. Hey, you know, look at all the examples of how he used women to bring others to him. Let's look at the example of the two women that went to the tomb. They're, they're, legally, their witness couldn't be, couldn't be taken unless there was uh, an affirmation or confirmation from there were certain circumstances. Legally, they, their witness couldn't be, their testimony couldn't be taken unless certain things were met. But he chose to do that. Women have a very important role in Scripture. Anyway, how about the equality and the gifting in the eyes of God, the gifting of the Holy Spirit to all believers equally? I believe that this supports the ordination of women to pastoral roles. You may ask, okay, what do you actually believe about women teachers and ministers? There, Mr. Dr. Sean. I have to start with this. Our biases, we have to look at this. We have to accept it. Our biases are deeply ingrained, right? You can't turn the Titanic around in a teacup. They're deeply ingrained. And we believe what we want to think, right? Because we've always thought that. Now I'm going to say right here, my dear friend, uh, Steve, Pastor Steve, my friend, my neighbor, my pastor, we, I'm sure we disagree on this. I still love him. He still loves me. We're good friends. That doesn't stop us from, from serving Christ and being followers of the way and teaching others. It doesn't stop us from that. It doesn't stop us from being friends. Our friendship doesn't change because on some things we disagree. Look, we believe what we want to think. 
and we've what we what we've been taught whether right or wrong right we've been taught this and so in order to to accept this teaching and go well maybe i changed my mind on this you make a good point whether you do or you don't let's still be friends this is why i encourage people folks I encourage people to take on the biblical languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Learn the culture and the customs of the people in the Bible, the people of the book, the land of the people. Otherwise, how, how will you know if you're receiving incorrect or inaccurate or worse, or worse, because there's a lot of it, biased teaching? You know, look, most often... Teachers and preachers believed what they wanted to believe. And so the cycle goes. Based on scripture, and I'm, inf I'm informed by a hard-earned knowledge of language, customs, and culture, as such, I believe scripture supports a place for women to be teachers and ministry leaders. I'm confident many Christ-honoring women could out-preach me, out-interpret scripture, out uh, present the gospel of Christ, and they could do it more theologically and scripturally and contextually than their male counterparts. Come on, that, you know, hey, that's just how it is. Doesn't mean they're always right. Doesn't mean because they're women, they're always right. Doesn't mean because men are always right, because that's not the case. Sometimes things are wrong. I've had pastors who have preached for 30 years and I stand in their pulpit if I'm invited by them to preach. I always encourage them, listen to what, you know, listen to a good cross section of my preaching before you invite me, because I don't want you to be sitting there in the audience going, why did I invite this guy? Right? I want you to know what you're getting into. Well, there have been times where I've preached in places where the pastor is a, a person who has been a pastor or ordained minister for. 30, 40, 50 years even. And they've come up to me afterwards. And, and I thought, oh boy, I'm going to hear it now. And they say, I want to hear more about this. I, I've been teaching this my whole life because this is what I was taught. But now when you present it this way, I think, and these are not people prone to be swayed, right? These are people, they're firm in their faith. They don't sway from side to side. Biases run deep. Traditions are 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 there for a reason. But I've had, I've had pastors come up to me and say, hey, let's talk more about this. I, I'm real curious about this. And I've had others in tears who said, I've been teaching wrong all these years. Not that I'm some special thing. I'm not. I'm a putz. But I've studied this in depth. So you have a little bit of knowledge. I went at it without a bias. In fact, I was fighting my bias to the other way. If you're a congregant, you know how this came about. Remember, as my buddy said, oh, this is happening. They're, they're ordaining a, a female. And, and what do I say? How do I argue with this? And I'm not mad at him for doing that. I think that's what you do, right? We have biases and, and some of them are correct and some of them are incorrect. And I encouraged him, let's think about this, right? I said, give me a minute to answer this. I want to, you know, because I've preached sermons on this many, many times. I have a lot of teaching on it. And, but let me call it down to something I can send you in text and, but it doesn't need to be an argument. You don't need to argue the case. Just consider it, consider what I send you. And then, you know, we'll go from there. And he and I, we disagree. Well, we, we're still friends. I love the dude. He was going to drive all the way up here from, from near Charleston, South Carolina, Goose Creek, South Carolina, and give me blood. Cause he has especially potent blood. For my procedure, by the way, thank you all for praying for me. We'll talk more about that in a second. But he was going to do that. He's good. He's a good friend. He's a triking buddy. A buddy in general. We're not. We don't have to stop being friends. We don't. We disagree. So what? So if you're, but I encouraged him. If you're a congregant, if you're sitting in that church, um, and you're a congregant who could never submit to a female minister. You'd never in a million years sit, submit to a female. And you would sit in the congregation kind of uh, grinding your teeth. You'd have negative thoughts about her. You'd maybe consciously or subconsciously undermine her. You'd be, maybe subconsciously you're hoping she'll fail. Then you'd benefit from searching your heart. This is what I said to him. Searching your heart and your own biases and deciding whether or not you need to shift your paradigm or 
change their church. Just change the church. You don't have to leave being uh, angry. You don't have to leave being, you know, trying to destroy the church. Okay, you disagree. This is something we have a difference in, in belief here. And just move on to another church. Maybe that more closely aligns with your paradigm. Now, I want to say this. Uh, by the way, um, you know, obviously you're, you're listening to this on playback. Um, I, I, let me let me say this. Two things I want you to be aware of. I mentioned it earlier. I want to mention it again. Obviously, subscribe and share. If you haven't, there's nothing. I don't understand what would stop you, but whatever. If you don't think this is a value, I, don't subscribe or share. But if more people, if we want more people to see and hear this teaching and the other teachings on True Word, Faith for Life, the YouTube channel. Now I have, thanks to Christy, um, the host of Topsoul Area Insider podcast, an amazing interviewer. She's utterly amazing. She's better at what she does than she thinks. Um, she has helped me immensely. Taken, She's a busy, busy person. And she's helping me get on all these podcasts. So what I have to do after this broadcast is I have to take the audio file off. And every time I do it, I forget. I have to remind myself again. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, you know, I'm the 50 first dates guy. So I don't remember. So I have to do it again and again. And you might say, well, you should write yourself a note. I do. I write myself notes. I write myself little study guides. Uh, my friend Bites, you know, that's that's one thing they do is bullet point study guides. Oh, this is something new. Let me write out a study guide or let me, standard operating, you know, just as a reminder. So I do those things, but I still, it's very difficult, especially as it relates to technology. I, my brain injury is such that I don't embrace it very well. I want to, but I don't, not anymore. And I can't learn that particular thing. It's just within that realm of the multi-hemispherical brain injury. So I want to say Christy has helped me get on the podcast because there may be times when, um, oh, thank you, Heather. Yeah, she was great. You know, I opened up more. Now, obviously, I didn't open up, you know, that's maybe 10% of the, of my story that I gave. But that 10% is about 9% more. It's it's 90% more than what I've ever, ever shared before in any interviews. And I've been interviewed on television. I've been interviewed um, I think TBN, uh, the Alive Network, all of these different places, different, you know, all these big things. And I've never shared that much. So th she's an excellent interview. You know, we did over four hours of interview. It was amazing. Now, obviously, the podcast that she did, there's a link in, in the, my uh, bio or the description of this show. There's a link there to that. Well, now she has introduced me to Buzzsprout. Uh, dot com and now I'm I'm on that I pay to be a part of that um, it everything costs you know I all this stuff costs and so I'm trying to do it on my own but the fact of the matter is she has been so generous and so kind to help me with that um, ongoing helping me with it to get it right and do these things well so right after this I'm gonna pull that audio file, and I'm going to try to link the two in GarageBand. I, it took me three hours yesterday to get it right and before I put it on to the podcast. And then it sends them out to, I put it on Buzzsprout. You can subscribe there to me, whatever. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs me, but it doesn't cost you. Um, and and that then you will know every time I do it. That way, if you're driving in your car, you got a long trip, hey, listen to some podcasts, you know, and it stops right where you stop. Same way with YouTube, but YouTube is obviously the visual, and I have a face for radio, so why not? Don't subject yourself to this, um, and you can join that. So I, I want to finish up today with two things. One is prayer, but the other thing is, look, these are hard teachings, right? I do a teaching on divorce, uh, what the Bible actually says about divorce on the True Word Faith for Life channel, um, YouTube channel. So go there. It's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. And, and, and watch that. It is extremely controversial. But I want to remind you of this. My pastor and my buddy, Steve, and I disagree on that. We probably disagree on this. I don't know. But we're still friends. I still love him. He still loves me. I'd give my life for him. He'd give 27 cents for me. Maybe if he had it or he could borrow it. No, 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 he would. I love him. I love the other people that I disagree with. My close buddies and friends, we don't have to uh, agree at all. I have a great friend who doesn't believe in any of this at all. The whole church thing, the Bible thing, they don't believe in any of it. 
It's just not in their realm. But we're still friends. And I love them. And I encourage you to do the same thing. That said, let's pray, and then we'll close. Heavenly Father, what a good God you are. You know, a, you're not a good God. You are the good God. You're not an amazing God. You are the amazing God. And to you, we give all our glory and our honor and praise. I pray that you have been lifted up in this message. I pray that, that, that the people who are taking the time both now under the live, uh, listening live anywhere where they're listening, and those who will come back and listen later. I pray, Father, for that dear brother who is standing guard at the embassy in Iraq. Baghdad, Father, protect them. Protect them. All of our dear brothers and sisters serving around the world, both as military, standing in the gap for us, standing in the gap for our country. I pray also for the first responders, the, the police, the fire, the ambulance, all of those things. I pray that, that you would place a covering over them. I pray that we as citizens would be supportive and encouraging and protecting of those who protect us. Heavenly Father, for those that are facing yet another major storm and the flooding and the destruction, Father, I don't pretend to understand. I sure wish it didn't happen, but Father, I pray for those people, especially my dear friends at Sea Hag Marina and all those who depend on that place for a job for the economic stability of the region. Father, I pray that you protect them. As the king tide comes, I pray that you would protect them. Hold back those waters. I know we come to you and we ask for things sometimes and we just don't understand what we're asking. But Father, I, I pray that you would bless us with a deeper and a greater understanding. I pray that as we, as we study these challenging things as, and as I present my viewpoint, the, the challenging things that I teach, I pray, Father, that it wouldn't separate us, that it would bring us together, and that others who don't know you would know you, would come to know you because of our love for one another. And Father, I thank you for the greatest act of love ever done to mankind. You're giving your Son for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Oh, what a good God you are. I am amazed. I am amazed. How in the world could we ever repay you? Glory to God. In the name of your matchless son's name, Yeshua Hamashiach. I pray. I mean, and I mean. Thank you for listening. Shalom, shalom. I'm Chai Yisrael. We'll be back with more teaching soon. God bless you and keep you.